Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Esteban Parra Guerrero and I am the coordinator of Gender Programs and Services and LGBTQ Plus Programs and Services at the Cross Cultural and Gender Center. We are here today to commemorate Jane Addams. In the past, we will meet in the Peace Garden and have a huge celebration with entertainment, keynote speakers, and so much more. This year, however, due to COVID-19, we had to do things slightly different, but we're still gonna move forward and celebrate Jane Addams virtually. We will have President Castro, Dr. Jan Slaughter, a very special performance from Huachuku Oputa, and we'll close the program by having Dr. Kapoor support us in placing the garland on Jane Addams. Thank you so much for being here today, and I will see you soon. Hello, I am pleased to join in this special celebration of Jane Addams' incredibly powerful legacy. Jane Addams was responsible for the creation of the field of social work. She co-founded the first settlement house known as Whole House in 1889. She focused on caring for the poor, the sick, and the needy. She also sought women's suffrage and strived for more peaceful international relations. Jane Addams was the first American woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931, and she unfortunately died shortly thereafter. We honor her at Fresno State's Peace Garden because of her many contributions to a more peaceful world and her unrelenting focus on those in our community who are most in need of our support. I was raised by a, a very strong single mother and an equally strong grandmother. And my grandmother especially taught me about the values of discipline, integrity, and humility. And it is great, my great honor to serve as president of a university that has many strong women leaders in our administration, faculty, staff, and among our student body. And we're stronger and better and more compassionate because of them. Thank you for the opportunity to allow me to share a few brief thoughts and I wish you continued good health and safety. Thank you so much, President Castro. On behalf of the Cross Cultural and Gender Center, uh, we sincerely appreciate and value your time and of course your ongoing support. Thank you and we'll see you soon. Alrighty, so our next uh, special guest, uh, she is a Fresno State student. She is part of the Fresno State National Coalition Building Institute and she has so much talent. Please help me welcome Wachuku Oputa. Wachuku, the floor is yours. Baby girl, worthy woman, every one of us 
us is worthy. Every one of 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 us is worthy. Thank you, Wachuku. Maybe after this pandemic is over, if I still have some energy, we could probably start our own world tour where I'll be the background dancer and you'll be the lead singer. But sincerely, Wachuku, thank you so much. We really appreciate your presence and your talent. So next we have Dr. Jan Slaughter. Uh, every year we're so um, blessed and thankful to have Dr. Jan Slaughter as our keynote speaker, uh, where she would talk about some of the accomplishments that uh, Jane Addams uh, did over her lifetime and she will, this time she will focus on the suffrage movement and how black voices, black women, black leaders played a major role during the women's suffrage movement. Uh, with that being said, Dr. Jen Slaughter, thank you and the floor is yours. This is Jan Slaughter, Professor Emerita in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. I'm pleased to celebrate Jane Addams' birthday with you. Since this is the 100th anniversary of US women earning the right to vote, I'll focus on her work on women's suffrage, how that was linked to her peace work, and her work with African, African American women suffragists. In this slide, you see Jane's monument being set on its plinth in April of 2006. Women's Studies students researched candidates, women candidates for the Peace Garden, shared their findings with other students, and Jane Addams was the strongest candidate to emerge. She is the mother of social work in the United States and a pioneering thinker, writer, social justice reformer, suffragist, and pacifist. Jane worked with immigrants in Chicago on housing, sanitation, education, and labor reform. At Hull House from 1899, new U.S. residents held musical, theater, and poetry events, political rallies, used the library, saw doctors, organized labor unions, learned trades, and took English and citizenship classes, among other things. Jane shared her life's work and her bed with Mary Rosette Smith. Ms. Smith is much less well known and had much less of a public presence than Jane did. When the pandemic lifts and the air clears and you visit the Peace Garden, take a look at the pictures incised on the plinth or base of the monument. Three of these are in these slides and they just depict some of Miss Adams' efforts and accomplishments. On the bottom of this slide, you can see the March for Women's Right to Vote. This is her Nobel Peace Prize tribute and a couple of quotations. But women didn't have full rights. Settler women and their descendants couldn't be full citizens. They couldn't own property or vote. In contrast, Native American women of the Haudenosaunee nations enjoyed political equality with men. The youth in this picture is holding a nominating belt. Women nominated and selected chiefs and no doubt made these belts. When they weren't seizing land and killing American Indians, European colonizers learned of this equality. White male settlers incorporated elements of these nations' governing practices in the U.S. Constitution. But so strong was the European ideology of women as unfit for citizenship that these founding fathers did not provide settler women the political equality Haudenosaunee women experienced. Uh, this is a slide that shows uh, at the bottom some of the women founders of the struggle for women's equal rights uh, who were settler women and then some Haudenosaunee women. These are the 
lands that belonged to the five Haudenosaunee nations. So what did Jane Addams, 50 years later, pictured here, reason about women's exclusion from citizenship? Men only voting was a leftover from times, Jane Addams said, when only those who could raise their warrior shields could vote. Governing was about protection from enemies and outsiders. These warrior values have persisted in political life, even in cities. In our time too, repressive militarized police command far too large a share of city budgets. Most of the departments of a modern city, Adams thought, can be traced to and mirror women's traditional activities, keeping places clean, providing care for the sick, promoting safety, teaching, and playing with the young. Since women learn these skills at home, she reasoned, they should be taking them out into the wider world and applying their know-how and values to direct their efforts toward policymaking or municipal housekeeping. This slide and the next one illustrate some of the topics the municipal housekeeping movement addressed, cleaning up garbage and getting contaminated meat out of the stores. But in order for women to engage in municipal housekeeping, that is to hold public offices, women needed the vote. Many suffragists were, like Jane Addams, community organizers committed to reforming labor practices, reforming schooling, racist practices, and immigration policy. Jane Addams worked with journalist and organizer Ida B. Wells Barnett, from whom she learned about the widespread practicing of lynching African Americans. Addams joined Barnett's campaign to stop it. Both women wrote articles against lynching, but while Adams in her anti-lynching article argues for the rule of law, Wells pointed out in an answering article that Adams did not challenge the assumption that black women who were lynched were guilty of the crimes they were charged with. We see that racism is pervasive and unlearning it is endless. Our contemporary policing and prosecution and incarceration policies are but some of the evidence that racism is still alive in the U.S. Both Adams and Wells Barnett worked on women's suffrage, but racism in the suffrage movement prompted Wells to organize the Alpha Suffrage Club. Wells Barnett and Adams did work successfully together to stop racial segregation of Chicago schools. This is a sample ballot uh, to grant Illinois women the vote on city and federal elections. Women were able to get the vote in some states and for some elections before the U.S. Constitution was finally amended. This was the first large organized political march ever to be held in Washington, D.C. It had five to 10,000 marchers, and this was a march for women's right to vote but racism was enacted there too. Southern white suffragists insisted that black women march at the back of the parade. Ida B. Wells, for one, defied this decision by white organizers and moved forward to march with the Chicago delegation. Women's suffrage organizing was frequently coupled with their activism to stop war. In 1915, at the outset of World War I, women formed the American Women's Peace Party, which had two aims, to keep the U.S. out of World War I and to secure the vote for women. Jane Addams was the first president of this party. Note that the second plank in their platform besides peace was women's vote. This is a banner that they held um, trying to keep the U.S. out of World War I. Many delegates from the Women's Peace Party traveled to The Hague in the Netherlands in 1915, 50 of them did, to meet with other progressive women in order to try to stop World War I. This was a meeting of the International Congress of Women. 
a picture from that Congress of some of the 1500 delegates. Back in the States, we see women still campaigning for women's right to vote. This is 1919. Incidentally, women's suffrage activists, besides inventing massive political parades, invented protest picketing of the White House. Picketers stood at the fence six days a week for four months, and many were beaten and jeered at by men, then arrested and taken to jail. When they went on a hunger strike, they were force fed. Women kept up the pressure. We're back in, in Europe, in Zurich, Switzerland, the war was ending, peace was being negotiated, but still the 19th Amendment uh, was lingering in Congress in the U.S. At the next International Congress of Women in Zurich, it was a smaller Congress. It was the end of the war in May 1919. As the terms of the Versailles Treaty were being negotiated, women pacifists and suffragists from both sides of the war reconvened they worked to pressure treaty writers to include the following topics in the treaty. Total disarmament, an end to naval blockades, full and equal suffrage, and basic rights for minorities. They called for the adoption of a woman's charter to promote equality for women in marriage, education, and job training. They called for the end of slavery and the sex trade, and for economic security for women and children. At this point, delegates renamed their organization the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and Jane Addams was elected its first president. Mary Church Terrell was also a suffragist and a pacifist. Adams ensured that African-American educator, organizer, and president of the National Association of Colored Women, Mary Church Terrell, be supported as a Women's Peace Delegation member. Terrell and Adams had also been working together as founders of the newly formed NAACP. Terrell, the first black college female U.S. graduate, had been the first black woman to attend the 1904 International Congress of Women, which was held in Berlin. A very erudite and highly educated woman, she delivered her address there in German, French, and English. But racist views persisted and still persist. Despite Terrell's renown internationally, Adams had to intervene at the 1919 Congress to ensure Terrell's resolution, resolution on race equality was passed. Back in the U.S. later in 1919, the U.S. Congress had passed the 19th Amendment on June 4th. Suffragists then traveled the country to campaign for its ratification by at least 36 states, which they did for 14 months. Ratification was finally accomplished on August 18th, uh, 1920. In this slide, we see a monument to Feb and Henry Byrne Feb was, uh, sorry, Henry was the Tennessee legislator who was the ultimate and deciding vote in favor of ratifying the right for women to vote. And he only did so because he received a letter from his mother telling him to do the right thing. We see in this slide, we see Fed Ensminger Byrne and her son, Harry, who cast the deciding vote. Campaigning for women's suffrage was arduous, but had its lighter moments. In this slide, we see Alice Dewar Miller's somewhat satirical take on why men should not vote, written in response to some men's views that women did not have what it takes to vote. Meanwhile, in Chicago, Jane Addams would take the stage between vaudeville acts to stump for the vote. In response to the reasons advanced by anti-suffragists why women should not vote, she retorted with her own set of reasons men should not be allowed to vote. The first is militarism. I quote, you are so fond of fighting, you'd very likely forget that the real object of the state is to nurture and protect life. And out of sheer vain glory, you would be voting away huge sums of money for battleships. 
Every time a gun is fired on a battleship, it expends or explodes $1,700, as much as a college education. You would be firing off these guns as mere salutes, simply because you so enjoy the sound of shooting. Her second reason was capitalist greed. You have always been so eager to make money. What assurance have we that in your desire to get the largest amount of coal out of the ground in the shortest possible time, you would not per permit the mine supports to decay until the percentage of accidents among miners would be simply heartbreaking, unquote. The 19th Amendment was ratified on August 20th, 1920 and entered the Constitution on August 26th. Just as we have the monument to Jane Addams, so Bristol, England has just installed one to Black Lives Matter activist, Jen Reed. Her likeness replaces a statue to a British slave merchant that was recently tossed into a river in England. The work of Jane Addams, Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, and Jen Reed is not done. We must work to reverse voter exclusion, to register voters, to make sure voters have access to mail-in ballots during this deadly pandemic, as we struggle against police brutality and racist policing and incarceration policies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jan Slaughter. And we hope that next time we celebrate Jane Addams, it will be in person like we have uh, in the past. So we have come to the conclusion of our program today. Uh, Dr. Kapoor, who's often recognized as the visionary of the Peace Garden, uh, once again will be joining us uh, today to place the garland on Jane Addams. For those who are unfamiliar with the Peace Garden, I highly encourage you all to please come during the weekend, uh, if it's safe, bring a book, bring a snack or something and enjoy sitting in the Peace Garden. It, it really is extremely peaceful, at least to me as an undergrad and grad student and now as a professor here on campus, um, I always enjoy walking through the Peace Garden. We hope that in the future, uh, you know, Nelson Mandela will be added as a fifth statue. Um, but with that being said, Dr. Kapoor, again, thank you so much. You know, even through this pandemic, you continue to support us. And um, thank you. Uh, first of all, good morning. And thank you very much for including me in this celebration to honor Jane Adams. We are very fortunate that we have Jane Adams in the Peace Garden. This memorial came into 2006 after the requests and appeal by our female students and faculty. They complained to me, how come that there is no woman of peace in the Peace Garden? I said, dear sisters, let us get ready if you provide the leadership. So I helped them, walk them through the passage, because there are a lot of uh, uh, rules and regulations here one has to know. So I am really glad that we have, and we feel very fortunate that we have Jane Adams in the Peace Garden. Jane Adams is very well known for many, many things. I consider her a great social worker, and a great reform, social reformer, and a peace activist who advocated human rights globally. She started many activities and projects in Illinois and Chicago area, including the settlement houses. I think there are a lot of information about her and her work. People should study and read more about her. But we feel very good that we have her in the Peace Garden over here. And another thing that I really want to emphasize that she was the first woman who got the Nobel Peace Prize and that was from United States of America. So that was a very, that around 1930, 31 in that year, she got the Nobel Peace Prize for her work in the peace building. So she is a great peace builder and her work actually inspires a lot of us, social workers, people in the women's studies, human rights, peace building, they all feel very inspired by her work. And she was also the president of, first president of Women in the International League for Peace and Freedom, which we call WIPS, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She was the president of that. 
and she did a remarkable job in actually persuading the world leaders about the consequences of the war like that over there. Though she could not stop the war, but she did pave the way for peace building globally. So we feel very fortunate that we have her in the Peace Garden and I hope we have more women of peace in the Peace Garden on some day, including Rosa Parks, because we do have Gandhi, Dr. Adder, uh, Dr. King, and Cesar Chavez. Pretty soon we hope to add Nelson Mandela also in the Peace Garden. And Dr. Castro and myself are the co-chair of the project, and we are working on the project very diligently, though we have slowed down because of the virus and all these other kind of barriers that we are experiencing actually. So Peace Garden, as you know, is a very, uh, I consider it a soul of the campus. And Dr. Castro always says the jewel of the campus like that. So we are very fortunate that we have a Peace Garden on this campus and we have all the dignitaries who have sacrificed their lives, given a lot of their time and energy for what we are enjoying today, a peaceful life, though there are our problem, we keep on working. These are the people who provide us inspiration. Thank you very much for including me in the celebration. Peace to all of you. Peace be with you. Peace be upon you. On behalf of the Cross Cultural and Gender Center, we want to thank President Castro, Dr. Kapoor, Washuku Oputa, Dr. Jan Slaughter, and of course, a very special thanks to our student coordinator, Nicole Hoy. We wanna wish all of our Fresno State students, staff, faculty, and administrators a very successful and healthy semester. We miss you all, and we hope to see you soon. Take care.